as a researcher who works on climate change, I could be accused of having vested interests when I say that this symposium is of major importance. However, as a gardener, when I walk outside and see irises blooming in my garden in London, Ontario on the 1st of November, I know climate change is real. It is a pleasure to be working with the uh, McGill University on this important subject and having a number of individuals um, from different disciplines addressing the importance of climate change. The Royal Society has been actively engaged both through our activities as it relates to uh, biodiversity and climate change, which is now a priority leading on from the COVID-19 task force. And I would also note that recently the Royal Society of Canada has taken a lead in the preparation of a document, Climate Change and Health in the Americas, which involves all of the uh, 26 member, uh, members of IANIS. This is an important subject, and I am sure that today we will hear many interesting, although some rather disturbing issues as it relates to the situation at hand, but we will also hear of things that we can all do to move forward and address the problems that are arising from the situation of climate change that we are faced with today. Thank you. Alors, bonjour tout le monde et merci. Yeah, hello, everyone, and thank you, Jeremy, for that introduction. Thank you for the Royal Society for having organized this meeting. It's, it falls at the best possible time, and thank you for having included me in, in as part of this day. And I want to start by congratulating the Royal Society of Canada for organizing this very timely meeting. I'm just back from the COP26 where we heard about all the challenges that the globe, uh, all countries were in it all together, face, in fact, uh, for the years ahead. So um, mitigating and adapting to climate uh, change are going to be defining um, elements, defining topics uh, of uh, our century. And Canada is well placed uh, to do it uh, right. Uh, we have many resources, human and physical resources, to be able to go through this transformative change. In fact, science tells us that uh, when we put our and ex experience from the COVID tells us that when we put our mind to solving a problem together, we can we can do it. And together means many disciplines, many countries collaborating and many sectors as well. So we're going to need science everywhere. We're going to need it in government for um, policy uh, evidence-based uh, decision-making. We're going to need it in industries to get new technologies. We're gonna need it in, uh, of course, the walls of our uh, academia. And we're going to need it to engage in a continuous dialogue with our uh, fellow citizens because uh, information is going to be critical and researchers, scientists, and scholars have very important roles to play both within the confine of their research and also um, in public life uh, as well. So the, 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 the timing I said couldn't be uh, better to have this, to, to have this uh, meeting. And there are, um, you know, two, three elements that I would like uh, uh, to stress as we go forward. I talked about the importance of science moving forward and science is going to give us the solutions uh, to, that we need to adapt to climate change and to mitigate climate change. This is by ways of technologies, but also by ways of behavioral changes, policies, regulations. So we're going to need all these disciplines to come together. We're also going to need everyone in this. We're gonna need to hear diversity of voices. We're going to have need diversity of knowledge systems and we're going to need diversity of expertise. So as we tackle this together, let's remember that everyone has something to contribute. And last but not least, international collaboration. 
And this is why I'm just so delighted that the Royal Society of Canada is putting this, uh, this panel together with the um, Embassy of France and together with, with the, re, to amplify the voices from the other uh, academies and, and the, the G7, G20 academies, as Jeremy mentioned. We're going to, strength, to have to strengthen international collaborations. We're gonna have to engage in, 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 in more meaningful uh, dialogue and meaningful work together across the globe for the years to come. So some may, may find it um, uh, anxiety generating to consider what lies ahead. I personally think it's, it's very exciting. It's, it's exciting because it's going to usher uh, new ways of doing, uh, new uh, ways of living, and it's going to highlight the importance of science and knowledge like never before. So have a great day, and I look forward to the deliberations. Thank you. Uh, hi there, everyone. Bonjour, uh, bon matin tout le monde. Uh, my name is Rick Smith. I'm the uh, president of the Canadian Institute for Climate Choices. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be with you here uh, this morning. Uh, I'm joining you today from uh, rainy Toronto, uh, the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. And I know that you're joining us today from uh, places near and far, and I want to acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of the lands that you're zooming in from uh, this morning as well. Um, as, as Dr. Niemer just, uh, just mentioned, all this week, the Royal Society of Canada is hosting daily discussions as part of its annual Celebration of Excellence and Engagement series, focusing on the most important issues of our day. Uh, now, over the course of this week, thousands of delegates from across Canada, from around the world, are engaging in science sessions featuring the insights of hundreds of scholars, artists, and scientists. And it's in this context, it's in this broader context that today's session is occurring. Uh, depuis uh, 2005, les Académies nationales Since de science... 2005, uh, the Academy, National Academies of Sciences of G7, the G7 have prepared uh, statements. And in 2018, the RSC began organizing annual G7 research summits in order to amplify the findings and next steps outlined in one or more of the S7 statements. Alors, aujourd'hui, la Société de du Canada, uh, la Sommet de recherche sur du G7 va mettre l'emphase sur um, le changement climatique et les options d'adaptation et d'atténuation en utilisant uh, la déclaration S7 sur uh, la carboneutralité comme catalyseur de discussion. Je veux féliciter la Société de du Canada pour la structure de l'architecture de cette séance de cette semaine et de celle-là d'aujourd'hui sur le changement climatique. Le fait que ce produit sur le changement climatique est intégré dans euh, cet événement érudit euh, qui dure une semaine est une réflexion de la reconnaissance de la Société royale du Canada de l'importance centrale du changement climatique dans nos vies, euh, les défis que ça pose et également les répercussions de, euh, du changement que la, que le changement climatique a sur les vies des Canadiens. Ça fait pas si longtemps que le changement climatique, c'est une discussion de, euh, qui était surtout restreinte euh, aux gens qui étaient ciblés sur la politique environnementale. En fait, à, à l'ONU, le COP de l'ONU, je viens de, re, de revenir de, du COP 26 à, à Glasgow. Euh, en fait, c'était des événements euh, où l'assistance à surtout des euh, ministres de l'environnement et des, euh, des gens qui... Euh, préconisé pour l'environnement, mais ce n'est plus comme ça. Mon institut a dit récemment, a fait un sondage auprès des Canadiens sur l'attitude face au changement climatique et les résultats en disent long. Euh, au cours de euh, l'été 2021, les attitudes de nos co-citoyens euh, à l'endroit du changement climatique, il y a eu une transition. Euh, le fait qu'on voit régulièrement euh, des, des événements euh, euh, climatique, de, de météorologie euh, extrême, c est, c est, c est, ça, les, clim, les euh, Canadiens, ce n'est pas une question de, ce pas un danger au loin, mais c'est une menace proche à leur santé et au bien-être de leur famille. La science 
de ciência. About this today. Uh, one example that I would underline is the recent rise of attribution science. Uh, I think uh, this new branch of climate change science is extremely significant. And Time, Time magazine has actually recognized this contribution by naming two attribution scientists to this year's uh, annual list of 100 most influential people in the world. Uh, until recently, scientists frequently talked in generalities about the environmental changes that climate change was driving, but then those same scientists were loath to bring this analysis down to the level of what Canadians and people around the world are experiencing every day in terms of extreme weather phenomena. Attribution science, this, uh, this new generation of statistical and modeling methodologies that can be used to attribute specific extreme weather events to climate change has closed this empirical gap between the theoretical and the specific. Uh, and as a consequence now, and as a very recent phenomenon, uh, you regularly see scientists speaking with confidence about the cause and effect of climate change, and often in the same news cycle in which the extreme weather event in question is occurring. This new real-time scientific analysis will increasingly have an impact, will increasingly shape the broader public discussion on climate change. Uh, the recently concluded COP26 also served notice that climate change has been broken out of its uh, environmental policy pigeonhole. Uh, mon uh, principal point à retenir uh, de mon séjour The main Glasgow, thing that I retain from my time in Glasgow is that the discussion on climate change is wider and deeper than ever. Uh, two weeks ago of an agreement uh, between the EU and the US to work together to achieve the decarbonization of the steel and aluminum industries, including through the use of focused tariffs, means that climate change policy is now trade policy. Uh, le dévoilement d'un partenariat de 8.5 milliards de dollars. The unveiling of a par partnership of 8.5 billion dollars between the uh, United States, uh, UK, France, uh, EU, and, and Germany to help uh, uh, South Africa finance a more quick, a faster uh, tra transformation from coal fi uh, fired uh, energy generation uh, see, means that uh, the policy on climate change is now a, a foreign uh, assistance uh, policy. Uh, of the world's biggest financial companies uh, has amassed up to US 100, 100, uh, $130 trillion dollars US, and yes, that's trillion with a T, of uh, private capital, uh, that capital is now committed to hitting net zero emissions targets by 2050. And that means that climate change policy is now economic and fiscal policy. So long story short, this is the net zero moment. And we're in a very different place than we were even a few months ago. And if I could have my first uh, slide, uh, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, We're in a very different place than we were even a few months ago. Uh, after the last month, 135 countries representing nearly 90% of global GDP have now announced their commitment to net zero targets. And as I, as I just mentioned, uh, so, have, uh, so has private capital uh, representing about $130 trillion dollars US. Very rapid change in the last few weeks. As a result of these detailed new initiatives uh, uh, announced in the lead up to the Glasgow COP and at the Glasgow COP, the International Energy Agency calculated last week that if implemented, the aggregate, the sum total of these new pledges would put the world on track for 1.8 degrees of warming, a total that is below two degrees for the first time and getting closer to the agreed target of 1.5 degrees Celsius. So yes, we have uh, more work to do, but we're making progress. And uh, as, uh, as Dr. Niemer just outlined, uh, I'm, I'm also optimistic about the progress that we're making. If I could have the second slide, please. Turning to Canada uh, here at home, as of July, with the adoption uh, by our parliament uh, of the new Net Zero Emissions Accountability Act, net zero is now the law of the land. And our federal government for the first time is bound to have uh, an unusually specific statutory uh, uh, timeline 
to publish our country's first ever 2030 emissions reduction plan before the end of the year. And the act actually includes a, a to-do list for that 2030 emissions reduction plan, including such things as sectoral reduction targets for specific industries uh, and necessary regulatory instruments. So very quickly, things have changed. And I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that the next six months could be, should be the most productive period of carbon reduction in our country's history. La chose uh, la plus importante uh, uh, dans toute... Uh, the most important thing, all of these questions of public policy is a sense of thrust. That's what uh, makes uh, it, it uh, goes uh, uh, the go up on the list of pr public uh, priorities. What gives the pu public and elected officials the se as the feeling that progress can be made, and that's what aligns uh, various interests around the, this process of change. So after the semaine that Danos net zero commitments to new protected areas to sequester carbon. Efforts to tackle climate change have undeniable momentum here in Canada and around the world. And what made this COP26 different than previous summits, I think, what distinguishes this period of time from previous periods in this long climate change discussion is the fact that we're moving from promises to plans. We're finally discussing and implementing the details that will deliver the carbon reductions that we need. And net zero, uh, as the S7 statement uh, uh, says, uh, and if you haven't seen that statement, it's quite good, check it out. Net zero is the framing over all of this activity. So we've got a great program for you today to dig down on this question of net zero. I just wanna run down uh, the, the day, the, the morning for you. After, uh, after I'm done here, uh, session one is, a great, is gonna be a great panel moderated by uh, Ivan Semeniak from the Globe and Mail. And that's gonna focus on technological pathways to net zero. Following that, uh, we're gonna have uh, a second panel moderated by uh, Hannah Hogue from the Con Conversation Canada. That panel is gonna, gonna look at policy pathways to net zero. And our third and final session of the day will feature uh, Darren Gilmore, the Executive Director of the Royal Society of Canada, and uh, Natan Obed, the President of the Inuit uh, Tapirit Kanatami, uh, reflecting on ensuring a just transition, making sure that, uh, that this transformational period in our country's history, in our, in our world's history, uh, doesn't uh, uh, adversely impact those who are most vulnerable, and that, uh, that the, the burden of this period of time is, is justly shared. I'm gonna be back after that session to close our proceedings. So, so grab a coffee if you haven't already, uh, sit back, get ready for some rich and stimulating discussion to illuminate this net zero moment. Nous avons un programme fantastique pour vous. It's a great program ahead of you today. Some of you are already tweeting about uh, this week's and today's events. And if you're doing that, please use the hashtag uh, uh, COEE2021. You can also tag the Royal Society of Canada. Um, and thanks for, uh, for publicizing these important discussions on your social feeds. Donc, uh, merci tout le monde. Uh, have a great day. So thank you, everyone. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our first discussion panel as part of today's Royal Society of Canada program on climate change implications, adaptation, and mitigation options for Canada. My name is Ivan Semenek. I'm the science reporter for the Globe and Mail, media partner for today's event. And it's my pleasure to be your moderator for this panel, which is focused on technological pathways to net zero. It's a big, sprawling topic. We're going to hope to offer you some snapshots uh, from, from the field. Uh, and in just a moment, I'll introduce you to our panelists. First, though, uh, a couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, English and French interpretation are available today. If you're not hearing me in the language of your preference, please go back to your agenda and choose the other language stream. If you require any assistance, please send a message through the chat box and someone on the RSC team will reach out to help. Second, there is a Q&A chat box to your right. 
You may use this for the duration of the symposium to ask questions about what you're hearing from our panelists, and we'll try and make time for audience questions later in the hour. Uh, so, so pop those questions in there. I'll keep an eye on the box and uh, try to feed that uh, to our panel. Now, let's get to our panel. Uh, first, I'm going to introduce Glenn McDonald. He's a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, a distinguished professor at UCLA in California, and he's co-principal investigator of the U.S. Department of Interior's Southwest Climate Adaptation Center. He's also the chair of an expert panel on Canada's carbon sink potential. That panel is, uh, has a report that is pending to the Council of Canadian Academies, so that'll be an interesting report to look for. Uh, and uh, Dr. McDonald joins us from Los Angeles today. Next, we have Isabel chernikowski lariau She is an internationally recognized specialist in CO2 capture and storage. And she's also president emeritus of the CO2 GeoNet European Network of Excellence. She's been based at BRGM, the French Geological Survey since 1984. And today she joins us, joins us from Orléans, France. And finally, Corey Maddy joins us from Nova Scotia today. He's a business person who works with the utility Efficiency Nova Scotia. He has strong links to the renewable energy sector and to Indigenous communities, organizations, and companies across Canada, including Community Foundations Canada, Indigenous Clean Energy, and Scotian Wind. Hi, Corey. Thanks for joining us. Uh, it's great to see you all. So I'd like to get right, uh, right off uh, the bat here get some reflections from all of our panelists today about what we've just been watching uh, unfolding in Glasgow with, with COP26, the latest uh, climate change, United Nations Climate Change Conference. Many uh, discussions, some agreements, some news has come out of the conference, uh, you know, and uh, kind of, I think, a mixture of, of feelings and opinions about, uh, about where, where that leaves us. Uh, in the kind of post COP twenty six uh, 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 future for the next for the next uh, year or two, so I, I'll go around the table. Corey, I'll start with you because uh, certainly renewables uh, were a big part of the conversation. What were you thinking uh, as things wrapped up uh, in in Glasgow uh, on the weekend? Muted. Uh, thanks, Ivan, for the question. Um, so I personally myself was not there, but I I was watching, I was reading articles, and I had a chance to uh, speak to some of my colleagues who who were there. And renewables was a huge part. It was a huge conversation piece, and different countries um, looked at renewables and spoke at uh, spoke about renewables in very different ways. Um, so um, it it was a big conversation piece last time. Happy to see it a larger conversation piece. Um, also at the uh, the event, um, there was a large indigenous uh, piece. There was more indigenous people there. Uh, there was there were events going on um, um, in the background. There were events going on in the city outside of the event. So definitely the uh, indigenous people have a larger voice at the event, and I hope to see this continue. Overall, I thought it was a great event. Uh, I do recognize there were some people that are questioning the the effectiveness or, you know, is this an event that we really need? And, and I frankly feel that we do need this. Um, I think it's better to have this event than, than not to have it at all. Got it. Um, Isabel, uh, certainly coal was, uh, was a big part of the, the news coverage last week and the week before. And, uh, and I know some of that, uh, you know, we all learned a new word, which is unabated coal uh, and how we have to stop using uh, fossil fuels that don't have uh, a, a, a concurrent uh, capturing technology. So uh, was, was that important from your perspective? W was there a sub sub substantial uh, progress last, last week? Oh, I think you're yeah, muted. So I, I was not in, in Glasgow for COP26, but I attended COP21 in, in Paris with the CO2 GeoNet European Network of Excellence. Mm -hmm. So CO2 GeoNet was present at COP26, organizing side events on the CO2 capture and storage technologies and organi organizing booths too. So uh, from my perspective, I, I think it's very important that it was recognized at COP26 that scaling up mitigation is essential and that the role of technology is essential too. 
and it is the the first time that in, in COP conferences that I I uh, I heard so many times men mentioning the CO two capture and storage technology, because uh, for for instance for uh, using coal without CO two emissions, what you call uh, an abate. Uh, 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 you need to have uh, to capture the CO2 emitted by the coal-fired power plant and store it, it underground. This is the only way we can go if we want to continue um, uh, to, to, to still use some of the coal in certain countries. This is absolutely necessary to capture the CO2 and store it deeply underground. Got it. And, and Glenn, let me uh, turn to you as well for some from reflections from your perspective. I know there was uh, there were additionally some some uh, re releases and, and uh, you know, are built around COP22, COP26. There were some conversations about carbon sinks, you know, WWF Canada and, and others were, were uh, talking about the peatlands, for example, and other other things that are specific to Canada. Um, from your perspective, uh, what did you see or hear at the conference and, and how has that uh, shaped your thinking about what comes next? Well, thanks, Ivan. I'm, I'm going to preface my comments by saying I'm speaking to you from Southern California and I'm on the traditional and unceded territories of the Chumash people here. And we're thankful for their, their land um, stewardship. Um, from my perspective, looking at nature-based solutions, um, this was a, a to me, a very exciting uh, a COP. And uh, it started with a bang, if you will, by the declaration by 28 countries that there would be a cessation of forest clearance by 2030. And that is really important. We're talking about a savings of roughly maybe 18.9 gigatons, 19 gigatons, looking at preliminary analysis. And I would suggest people, for instance, look at the World Resources Institute preliminary analysis. This could be a very, very big deal, not just for people who are interested in nature-based solutions, but, but in general, if this is followed through. Where does Canada sit in this thing? Well, about oh, you know, over 90%, maybe 98% of, uh, of the gains in terms of carbon, which is not released, uh, will come from the tropics, about 2% in the extratropical regions. But the boreal forest uh, is, is a very important component, of course. And, uh, so that was exciting, but what was more exciting is money is put into this, about $19 billion. And uh, you know, speaking to Corey, uh, in terms of indigenous uh, participation, 1.7 billion of that is specifically earmarked for indigenous people. So this was, to me, was exciting. And this is an important step. Uh, whether it's followed through or not, I don't know, but the 28 countries represent, you know, uh, over 80%, 87 to 90% of the forested land. So it's great. At the end of the conference, it was also really exciting. Twice in the agreement, the final agreement, the term nature-based solutions was utilized. And the importance of uh, ecologically based solutions, which have the double bottom line, for instance, of preserving biodiversity or preserving ecosystem functioning were mentioned. And in one, of the, uh, in one of the statements in the agreement, it specifically talked about uh, ecological solutions and the role of indigenous peoples in that. And so the recognition of indigenous peoples and twinning that with nature-based solutions to me was a very, very positive. I can have all kinds of other quibbles about the optics of that conference, which I do not think were good. I could have quibbles about the final watering down of the statement of coal and all of that. But looking at it from nature-based solutions, I think there was some really exciting progress made. Thanks very much, Glenn. And thanks all of you for your uh, perspectives just uh, to set the table. So now let's look forward. Let's look at those pathways, those technological pathways and other pathways that uh, you know, could lead us to net zero, which is the stated goal in Canada and, uh, and many other countries as well. Corey, I'd like to start with you uh, because of course, uh, you know, from your perspective on the East Coast, <laughs> renewables uh, are are in undergoing kind of an interesting are part of an interesting transition an interesting transformation uh, and becoming a, a, a bigger percentage of the power grid there from your perspective 
can you give us a, a sense of how that transition is going? How are renewables, wind in particular, becoming integrated into the grid? And what about that experience could be, uh, you know, what are the takeaways that, that uh, could be useful in, in a, as we try to scale up to in, in a bigger way? Right. Thanks, Ivan, for the question. Um, Nova Scotia, it's, it's been almost 30 years um, a journey to get to where we are. And a big proponent of that was, of course, the province of Nova Scotia and our power utility, Nova Scotia Power. Um, it was very clear that we needed to move away from fossil. Um, we're, we're still quite fossil heavy here. Uh, depending on the day, we can be high as 40% of our grid is coal. Um, but we've, 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 again, come a really far way. Um, Nova Scotia, like many coastal um, communities, it's very windy. So it was, it, was, it was a very easy choice for us to make. And Nova Scotia, we have a lot of hills, beautiful hills like the, the, uh, the um, highlands, uh, on, in Cape Breton. So um, it, it's a very natural, easy choice. And there's been some growing pains, but we, we managed to um, learn ways to manage the wind quite well. So now um, what we're looking at moving towards is, is, is tidal. And the Bay of Fundy is the world's strongest uh, title in the world. More water comes in and out of the New Minas Basin than every river combined in the world. Mm -hmm. So the research that's happening out of the New Minas Basin, the Bay of Fundy, um, is, is it's really leading the charge. Uh, there's lots of tidal energy research happening in other parts of the world, especially in Europe, um, but it's, it's on a, almost a different planet because the amount of force is just so um, unique. So some really great research that's coming out of there. Um, it's still early days, but when we are able to tap into that, um, we will certainly see um, more renewable energy come online. Um, also coming online is a um, hydro dam in uh, Newfoundland. Um, so this, this is, this is uh, well, sorry, in Newfoundland Labrador region. Um, so we're, we're taking advantage, best advantage of that, of course, working with the First Nations communities, but um, Canada is a resource rich country and we have a lot of resources to, 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 to use. So we're, we're, we're sitting pretty right now in Nova Scotia, but of course, um, always trying to grow and continue our way off of uh, coal. Got it. And, and just to follow up on that, I, you know, obviously there are many hurdles to overcome and there's already been a, a lot ch ch changing, uh, you know, to move from, from a power system that was almost entirely coal in the past. Um, what do you think are the, you know, what do you see as sort of the barriers or the obstacles? What are the big challenges? You know, is it, is it on the technical side, you know, how the renewables are balanced with, with the, the need for base load? Are, are there mm -hmm. other, is, is it kind of the way the power is distributed? I, I, I'm, I'm wondering what the, what specific challenges arise in that kind of transition. Yeah, no, great question. Um, some of the challenges that, um, I, that, that, that we see here is um, there is a lot of energy efficiency work to, to, to be done. Um, if, if we go back to think of the energy pyramid, um, the, the bottom of that pyramid is uh, knowledge and education. The second piece is energy efficiency and at the very top is renewable energy. So we still have some work to do in that bottom period pyramid, sorry, the education and energy efficiency. And we're, we're making some really good advances there. Um, some other barriers um, that we're seeing in the province, luckily isn't to do with um, buy-in for renewable energy. People see it. Um, I, you know, a lot of people understand it and, and we're, we're moving forward in that. Um, but uh, the, the, the big challenge is old money. Uh, there's a lot of old money and a lot of investment tied into um, some old energy projects. Um, we have a coal plant in Trenton, New Glasgow area, and it's a big coal plant that's been sitting there for quite some time. It's producing very cheap energy, um, and it's hard to move away from those very cheap um, um, sources of energy. Um, but I think as time goes on as, and as the useful life of these plants start to end near, 
Um, there's a real cost benefit analysis that has to happen, whether they refurbish or whether they move away. Um, Ontario has an incredible job of moving away from, from coal. Um, and I would say they've moved away from coal quite early on because there was still some life in a lot of the, uh, the coal plants there. Um, so I, I think it's just, you know, continue, continuing the hard work that we're already doing and just trying to, uh, to motivate some of that old money that's tied up in other projects and see it pushed into some of the exciting renewable energy stuff. Got it. Thank you very much. That's, uh, that that uh, gives us a lot of good perspective. Isabel, I want to speak with you next and ask you a little bit about, I know you're in France right now, but ask you about another Canadian project that, that you're aware of uh, in the prairies involving carbon capture and storage. That's where some uh, some demonstration technologies have been have been attempted, uh, and of course, this is your area of expertise. Um, you know, as you said earlier, there's going to be a need to continue to use coal and some other fossil fuels, at least for a time. Uh, and so, capturing that carbon is going to be important. Can you give us a sense of uh, what's happened in Canada and elsewhere, and where that technology is at now? Yeah, uh, so I, uh, I was involved, in fact, in an international research project uh, at Weyburn in Saskatchewan from uh, 2000 to 2004. There, you know, uh, CO2 uh, is being injected into an oil reservoir, in depleted oil reservoir for enhanced oil recovery. The CO2 is coming from the Great uh, Plain Sinfuel Plant in North Dakota in the U.S. and is transporting uh, with a pipeline to the Weyburn oil field. And the international research project uh, was looking at how to optimize the storage of CO2 while uh, and, uh, while um, recovering uh, extra oil with CO2 injection. How to uh, maximize CO2 storage because part of the CO2, uh, most of the CO2 we will inject in the oil reservoir will stay in the oil reservoir. So this project is going on. And uh, since, that, since that time in, in Canada, there are two other projects that uh, started. One in 2014, it's the Boundary Dam Coal Fired Power Plant in Saskatchewan. CO2 is being captured and uh, transported and injected into a uh, oil reservoir for an enhanced oil recovery. But also part of it is injected for research purposes in, um, in a sandstone rock deep underground, filled of salty water, what we call a deep saline aquifer. And then uh, there is a, a research ongoing to monitor uh, and, and predict the fate of, uh, of CO2 underground. And uh, there is another different project in Alberta this time, which started in, uh, in 2015, the Quest project, where they are producing uh, hydrogen from uh, fossil fuel. And uh, the, the CO2 is, is also transported and injected into um, uh, a, a deep reservoir on the ground, the same. So there are three big projects in Canada that are in operations already since a uh, few years, quite a long time, in fact. And in the world, globally, there are 27 uh, CCS projects operating. And uh, the capacity they are capturing altogether, 40 million tons of CO2 per year. Uh, so, including in Europe, there are two in, in Norway from since uh, already a long time. And, uh, but the challenge now is to accelerate deployment of the technology worldwide. Mm -hmm. Because um, if we want to achieve net zero globally by 2050, the International Energy Agency says uh, in its uh, net zero scenario, that we will need uh, to capture 7.6 gigaton CO2 per year in 2050. And currently, I told you, it is 40 million tons CO2 per year, which means 0 0.04 gigatons. 
and we need to reach 7.6 gigatons. So we have to multiply by 200 in a, in a short period of time. So this is the scaling up of um, the development and deployment of CCS globally is a key challenge. Wow, I thank you. I really appreciate you putting those numbers in context too. I was just trying to do that math in my in my head. So going scaling up 200 times uh, is is going to be quite a tall order. What do you see as the uh, the key challenges to that? What you know, if if people are rolling up their sleeves to try to get there, uh, what has to happen next with this technology? Yes, so. Technology speaking, uh, we are ready, I think, in the world to deploy CCS. Of course, we can always improve efficiencies of uh, all the, the, the various uh, technologies of the, the CCS chain, and also we can uh, reduce the cost, but we are ready to start the, uh, to, to start to deploy. And uh, the, the, key, the main challenges now are, are, are um, uh, the financing mechanisms, because uh, uh, there is a cost to deploy CCS and uh, around, it depends, it could be between 20 to uh, $150 uh, per tons of CO2. And uh, for instance, in Europe, the European uh, emission trading scheme, um, the, the carbon price is not, was not high enough to encourage the deployment of CCS. So, it's important that there are, there are subsidies or carbon credits or contracts for differences to uh, help the, to initiate the deployment of the technology. And we already, already see that in Norway, for instance, where there is a CO2 tax. We see that in the Netherlands and in the UK, where recently a contract for different mechanism was uh, implemented. And we see that uh, I know in, in the US, where there is a 45Q uh, carbon tax, carbon credit, um, tax credit that uh, is encouraging the development of many new CCS projects. I don't know what is the situation in, in Canada, but I know that the Canada, the federal government and uh, also the regional governments are are uh, supporting the project I was mentioning before. Got it. One last question, just uh, to put this in perspective, uh, and, and I think it's worth reminding people, even you know, because of course, getting off coal is is sort of a mantra uh, of, of the, uh, the the net zero objective. But you know, even if coal could be phased out for power generation. As I understand it, there's always going to be a need for some use of coal, for some coal combustion. Is that right? We'll never entirely stop burning coal. <laughs> yeah, so uh, uh, it's true that uh, if we are able with renewables, energy, and maybe nuclear also to produce uh, electricity, and we don't need any more coal, for instance, for, for power generation, as is the case uh, we have decided uh, in France, for instance, um, uh, there are still some industries that are uh, emitting CO2 and that cannot, and that uh, CO2 emission cannot be reduced easily. For instance, there are many industrial facilities like salmon plants, steel plants, uh, uh, glass factories, waste to energy plants, and, and many others. Uh, that uh, emit CO2. Uh, so there have been quite a, a lot of progress to reduce the emissions by adapting the processes, using some biomass, uh, um, for instance. And, um, but uh, there are still some incompressible CO2 emissions. And um, and that is why the, the Paris Climate Agreement set the goal of, of setting incompressible CO2 emissions with carbon sinks uh, by uh, mid, mid century. So the, the carbon sinks are natural, uh, natural based solutions. Uh, Glenn talked about that. 
but there is also the CO2 capture and storage, which is the geological carbon sink. We put back the carbon that was extracted from the underground, we put it back into the underground. It is a sink. And um, so uh, for, for many types of uh, industrial facilities that we need to build renewable energy, for instance, uh, or buildings, when uh, we, um, we have to offset the incompressible CO2 emissions to be net zero. That's why CCS is so important. Got it, excellent. Just, you know, again, really underscores why that is one of the crucial technologies and there will be others. I now want to uh, turn to you, Glenn, because we're on the topic of carbon sinks and and where to put that carbon. And of course, in addition to the possibility of uh, artificially capturing or technologically capturing carbon or, uh, as it's emitted, uh, you know, there are natural carbon sinks that increasingly are being looked at as, as you pointed out as, uh, as important for the whole equation. So let's maybe again, start with Canada, but I'm sure that this will be applicable to, to other regions as well. Can you give us a sense of, you know, what is what what are these nature based solutions for, uh, or carbon sinks and uh, and how do they they play in i mean we know that they're out there there are forests as you said and other places for carbon but how how does this get worked into the plan right so um, just as an overview a, a, a nature based carbon sink solution would be something like a forest where through photosynthesis CO2 is removed from the atmosphere, it's incorporated into the vegetative matter, and for instance, incorporated into the wood that forms the trunk of a tree. And a tree could live for 100 years, in some cases more than that, and that carbon is then sequestered in that biomass, in the wood. Uh, within a forest, it can also be sequestered uh, in the soil layer, and it could be in the soil layer in the case of, for instance, uh, organic soils like peatlands, for thousands and thousands of years. And so that's a sink. It's drawing the carbon out of the atmosphere and it's keeping it sequestered then in the terrestrial or the marine or aquatic environment uh, for a very long period of time, centuries to millennia. That's a natural carbon sink. That's a nature-based carbon solution. In Canada, there's a lot of interest in this because we have uh, two very, very uh, large uh, potential nature-based solutions. That would be uh, the boreal forest and to a certain extent, the temperate forests that we have uh, in Canada. And it would be the organic soils of the peatlands, which again, uh, are massive stores today uh, of carbon. And so those would be uh, nature-based solutions. Now, there has been an accounting done and it was been done by Nature Canada and uh, by the Nature Conservancy of the United States uh, recently of these nature-based solutions for Canada for sequestering carbon. And what was really interesting to me is one of the large ones comes out of agriculture. And that would be the use of cover crops. Cover crops are where, for instance, you plant legumes. You, you know, you plant clover or, or you plant a, a crop that you're not going to... Uh, be harvesting, but you're basically going to plow into the soil. You allow the biomass to remain there. Cover crops can be very, very important. If you use legumes, for example, they can enrich the nitrogen content of the soils. So they are, in a sense, a natural fertilizer. They're drawing CO2 out of the atmosphere. It's then going into the soil, and it can be locked up in the soils. And those cover crops, use of cover crops, can be a very, very important, in fact, one of the largest nature-based solutions that Canada has at its disposal. Other ones would be management of forests. Management of forests so that, for instance, you know, you are uh, optimizing the take up of carbon. Any products that come out of the forest, you're optimizing uh, the use of those so that the carbon uh, remains, for instance, in a product. Uh, or if it's utilized for energy, that there's as much recovery of CO2 as, as possible. So we have a portfolio in Canada of nature-based solutions that extend from forests, organic soils and peatlands, our coastal marshes, for example, 
but also our agricultural systems, both in terms of field agriculture and in terms of rangelands. Got it. You know, and I think it's so interesting that you're working on that, uh, that you're chairing that panel on Canada's carbon sinks. And I think, you know, one thing that we've heard a lot in the last couple of years is that uh, maintaining these carbon sinks or promoting these carbon sinks is also beneficial to nature, that it that it's uh, uh, kind of overlaps with another objective, which is to uh, to deal with the biodiversity crisis and, and the, the plight of uh, species at risk and, and kind of preserving natural habitats. But I, I think this might be a case where there's the devil in the details, because I guess if you're optimizing a landscape, I, I mean, I, I guess what I want to ask you is what are the limits? Like if we're optimizing a landscape for taking up carbon, is that what does that mean in terms of nature or how we're used to seeing those landscapes? Uh, you know, what are the limits to this approach? No, that's, I think that's a really important question. And, um, and also, you talked about the bottom line, the double bottom lines, triple bottom lines, you know, biodiversity ecosystem services. Let's not leave out of this indigenous peoples and indigenous peoples relationship to the land, the importance of the land as a integral part of culture and that sometimes it's hard for us to understand. And so I think we have to be really cognizant that if we go about this process, we have to think about biodiversity, we have to think about ecosystem services, we also have to think about indigenous peoples in terms of traditional land management practices that can be very, very uh, instructive uh, for managing these uh, landscapes in terms of use of the land today and in terms of aspirations and involvement. And so that's really important we can achieve that kind of triple bottom line where we're, we're you know we're taking carbon out we're sequestering it we are enhancing biodiversity and ecosystem services and we are also then uh, basically meeting the aspirations and needs of indigenous peoples but that then puts a lot of constraints for instance uh, if we look down here planting eucalyptus trees are great uh, sort of you know, centennial scale, 100 year uh, carbon sinks. They grow really fast. They take carbon out of the atmosphere like crazy, all that. But, you know, if you plant them all over the place, they're, they're changed the, the uh, environment. They're not going to promote biodiversity in some place like California. And they're not necessarily going to do anything for indigenous values and things like that. Similarly, you could imagine that a monoculture plantation in Canada of a fast growing uh, tree uh, decreasing the biodiversity completely, de decreasing the landscape value for indigenous peoples, but just sucking out carbon. Um, that's just not going to do it. We, we can't get there with that. So one limitation is you have to balance off the other needs that we have from the natural environment. No question about it. The other one that you just have to be aware of is these nature-based solutions are getting to 2030 Initially, there were estimates of maybe they could produce 20 to 30 percent of what we need to do in terms of carbon sequestration. Those have come down, particularly as people have done more careful accounting in the tropics. Maybe 10, 12 percent of what we need to do, we can get to with nature based solutions. In Canada, the study which I referred to, which looked at a sort of an accounting of where we are now, you know, when you look at it in terms of Canadian emissions, again, you're looking at maybe 10 to 12% of the solution. They're going to be helpful. They offer a triple bottom line, but they have got to be just one part of a portfolio that's going to take a lot more. And I'm struck by what Isabel said. We do have a pretty big hill to climb. We can't just look at nature-based solutions to get us completely out of that. Excellent. Um, all excellent points. Uh, I want to go around again with and, and follow up on what you said uh, also about sort of indigenous participation and, and uh, how that's, especially in Canada, I think how that's going to become important. Um, before I do, I want to note that we're getting some really interesting questions also from, from viewers of the panel. I've keep, I'm keeping an eye on those and I'll be uh, coming to the panelists as well. Again, we can't cover all the bases, but we have some questions, for example, about next generation nuclear as part of the uh, as part of the portfolio in the future. And I'd, I'd love to just sort of get some overall reflections. Before we do that, though, 
Um, Corey, I want to come back to you about uh, the issue of Indigenous communities as part, and you know, you have really uh, been involved in, in those kinds of conversations about, about where the Indigenous communities fit in. It's, it's interesting because when we look to renewables, whether it's uh, wind uh, or, you know, you mentioned a, a dam project in Newfoundland and Ra Labrador, which is obviously you know, dams are environmentally altering, uh, uh, you know, constructions, you know, and even solar to some extent, which, which obviously requires a, a surface area to, to work. All of these things have a footprint on the landscape. And, you know, there's some controversy associated with that. And if we look where, you know, where the potential is to expand uh, renewables, uh, you know, where is it windy? you know, where are there undammed uh, watersheds, you know, these often overlap with uh, indigenous lands and, and uh, objectives. So can you tell me a little bit about how the community buy-in fits in and, and, you know, what that will look like in the future uh, if we want to have a, a broader share of renewables in Canada? Certainly. And I mean, this is my, my, favorite topic of, 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 of the whole, the whole, the whole day. So um, I will disclose that I am Mi'kmaq, I'm Indigenous, and I'll also disclose that I'm not a lawyer. So don't take anything I say to, to, to your legal team. Um, but the, 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 the really important conversation here is duty to consult. And I'll, I'll speak about this in a second from an Indigenous community involvement point of view. But we, we all are from communities, we all live in communities, and whether you're Indigenous or not, um, everyone has a say uh, to a point. Um, so for, um, for Scotian wind, um, we have 20 wind turbines across the province, and any time that we're doing an event, sorry, any time we're doing a project, so putting up some turbines, we'll do a community event. We, we invite the public. Um, we have to do this um, as, as, as the province uh, requires us to do community events, but we uniquely really take um, a step early, a step often, and make sure we're getting good community buy-in. Um, not unique to us, uh, a lot of energy projects do this, but we'll provide a percentage back to a community champion or a group um, to make sure that we're getting back to the community. Um, somewhat unique to us, though, um, we allow the local community to invest into our project um, and studies show that people that are able to make an investment and get a dividend return um, they're they're more happy and they're they're less likely to complain about uh, about the turbine in their backyard so really really good and for our organization we provide a 20 percent of return on investment so they're very happy and we're we're, we're very happy about that from the, the Indigenous point of view, I mentioned duty to consult. So any time that a project is happening, there is a chance that it may trigger a duty to consult. Um, we've been in the courts for about 20 years now with duty to consult. So there isn't really a, uh, it, it's a little gray when, when it's triggered um, and it causes some discomfort, certainly. Um, but any time that the, that a province's Department of Energy or Department of Environment will issue a permit, the province may need to go and see if they have a duty to consult. And they'll, they'll issue that, that responsibility on to the, uh, to the project. Um, the duty to consult may require the company that's building the project to do a study. It may require them to uh, have meetings Ultimately, at the end of the day, um, the nation does not have a veto over the project going ahead, but they can certainly make it difficult. And what, when I'm consulting and when I tell organizations that the best way to um, make duty to consult a lot easier and to make sure that the community, the nation, is not going to be hard to work with is engage them um, for free. So don't don't put up barriers of cost, engage them early and engage them often. And don't go in with a plan already and then you just need a signature. Allow some flexibility when you're doing projects. Um, and the energy projects here in Nova Scotia have been very forward thinking on that. Um, they've been involving the nations very early. 
Um, so it's paramount to you, you, you need to do it. You have to engage the nations early on and, and equitably. Um, if it goes to court, it's gonna to go to the court of public opinion usually, and it, it never really ends that well for, for anyone. Um, so I encourage anyone that's looking at doing a project is, is to start relationship building um, as soon as you can. Got it. And you know, while we're on this topic, I just also want to and just kind of steer back to technology for a minute. Um, you know, a lot of indigenous communities are, uh, you know, they they have energy needs uh, at the moment. That's very fossil fuel intense. You know, you think of the northern communities that uh, have their big diesel fuel tanks and so on. And of course, the question is, is there a renewable solution? For communities like that, but of course they've got to be energy independent to make that work. I, I guess a, a big question there is storage, like electricity storage and battery technology. Um, I'm wondering, you know, in your conversations about how communities will function, where renewable could play a role. What's your impression of of the the battery storage question and and where that could take us? Certainly. Um, so from an, from a First, I'll speak about energy storage, and then I'll think up speak about battery storage. So, mm -hmm. biomass is a great store of energy, and in Yellowknife, and uh, you know, you know, all these other northern cities, there's a lot of forest there, and it's a great way to heat a building is to, is to use wood or wood pellets, and then you're also able to hire the local community to go and cut wood, or in places like in British Columbia, there's there's lots of um, driftwood or I don't know the technical term, but there's a lot of um, fallen logs around and they're burning this and it's, it's a great store of energy. So this, this, that's really exciting. Um, further north, like a community in Joe Haven, where I have some colleagues, um, they are doing incredible work with renewable energy. Um, you wouldn't think of a place so remote, but they, they, they're looking at wind, they're looking at solar, um, you know, really exciting stuff. From an energy storage point of view, um, it's it's cold up north, so that's that's good for for energy storage. Um, sometimes, uh, sorry, solar. It's good for solar if it's if it's quite cold. Not so much for energy storage. So there is some um, work to do. The technology is still very very new, but there's a there's an incredible business case for it. The per kilowatt, um, the, the 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 dollars per kilowatt up in the, the high north. Is outrageous. Um, so there's clearly, clearly a very good um, energy point of view. Um, I don't know, Ivan, if you want me to speak to the nuclear. Um, uh, uh, I, I want to go around, uh, let's hold on the nuclear for just one more minute, and I'll and we'll go around the panel because I think we we do need to bring that into the conversation. But I realize that's also on the table when people are talking about northern communities. So hold that thought, uh, and I know the audience is interested in this question too, and we'll 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 get to that. Let me first go to Isabel, though, because I have another follow up question about the carbon capture and storage, which is um, what do we know, Isabel, about the geological stability of uh, of these storage? You know, once we start talking about the amount of carbon that has to be captured uh, to really get to those goals, I think you said seven gigatons per year, if I'm remembering correctly, start thinking about putting that carbon back in the ground. How confident are experts now that that carbon can be stored safely or, or that it can be stored in a way that doesn't just find its way back into the atmosphere? Um, what, what's your impression of that side of the technology? Yeah, uh, so I think all scientists are now confident that this can be done. And uh, uh, a proof, uh, I, I will... Uh, Take the example of, of nature. Uh, in the in the nature, there are um, plenty of natural CO2 fields that are there underground for, for since millions millions of years. For instance, in, in France, there are eight uh, CO2 natural fields underground, deep underground, at one uh, two kilometers depth, uh, which were discovered when. Uh, looking, searching for oil and gas. They thought they have found such uh, oil and gas uh, uh, fields, but when they drilled, 
the fluid was pure CO2, which uh, accumulated in the underground. Uh, it is a CO2 of volcanic or mantle origin, and it accumulated in the pores of rocks, of sandstones, of carbonates. And uh, uh, above, there is a clay layer that block the CO2 that cannot move upwards. It's like, you know, oil and gas, they are trapped also in the pores of rocks with a clay layer on top. So it's the same. And in, in the nature, we can find these pure CO2 accumulations in the underground that are there since millions of years. So it's a kind of, uh, so the, in a sense, we could say that uh, CC, CO2 geological storage is also a nature-based solution. Of course, we inject CO2 underground using a well, but uh, then all the mechanisms, trapping mechanisms are natural underground. Um, so of course we cannot inject and store CO2 uh, everywhere. We have to choose the right location. Mm -hmm. And so we have to, to uh, explore the underground to look for uh, a location where there are deep accumulation of sediments underground. So that's, that's been not in the mountains areas, but we need accumulation layers of carbonates, sandstones, and clays where we can inject the CO2 and store it in the pores of the rocks, in the pore space. Uh, and uh, so I told you that we searched uh, for the, on this uh, new technology started already 30 years ago with many research projects in Europe and also in North America and many other parts of Europe. And now uh, we have developed uh, methodologies and tools to be able to, to, to select carefully the, the, the site, the storage site, to characterize and appraise, appraise them. And also uh, many uh, monitoring uh, techniques were uh, developed to be able to track the CO2 in the underground, in the reservoir where it is injected, but also in the overburden and even at the surface of the land or the seafloor, if it is an offshore storage. So many techniques have been developed. And also uh, the management of risk uh, has been uh, uh, studied in details. And uh, for instance, uh, you have to request a permit for storing the CO2. And in this permit, you have to prove that you have uh, uh, simulated how the CO2 will behave in the reservoir, how it will be trapped in the short term and in the longer term, even after the closure of the site. And you have also to put in place monitoring techniques and uh, have a remediation plans in case the CO2 is not behaving as expected. So in Europe, there is a, a European directive on the CO2, on the geological storage of CO2, which gives all these uh, guidelines. And there are also internationally ISO norms to, on, on CO2 storage, on CO2 capture, and, and so on. So, uh, and with all the, in addition, I told you before that there are already 27 TCS projects in operation. Uh, and uh, also many other uh, pilot research projects. So we have quite a, a very good uh, already experience to start deploying uh, CCS now. Got it. Thank you for filling in those details because, and you anticipated my question about how we know, uh, you know, how we'll know where, uh, where this storage can be successful. So it's, it's interesting to hear how far developed uh, this area is. Um, one more question for Glenn, and then we'll we'll come to uh, some of the audience questions. Um, you know, Glenn, one thing I think about when when we talk about the carbon sinks, uh, the natural carbon sinks, is that sense that maybe there's a there's a time variable with this uh, with this approach. That uh, you know, a carbon sink today may be a carbon source tomorrow. I think we're sort of getting a hint of that in the Amazon where it looks like part of the forest is now 
a net emitter of carbon. Uh, that was that made some news earlier this year. Is there a sense that uh, there's a critical window where we have to uh, make use of this approach? And and uh, how do we know that uh, those carbon sinks aren't going to change or be less amenable to taking up carbon in the future? No, that's that's a really great question, and that's one of the the issues that the the panel for um, Canadian Academies that, that I'm leading is really focused on. What's the sustainability of these? And there's there's two limitations there. One would be on just natural functioning of an ecosystem. You know, which part of its life does it, uh, in a sense, sequester the most carbon, and when does that drop off? And then there's what's going on with climate change changing the environment in which these ecosystems are functioning, changing the climate and changing their capacity. Look, you don't have to go to the Amazon to find that forests are turning into emitters of carbon. You only have to go to the boreal forest of Canada and Alaska. And studies have shown that in a number of parts of that forest, because of increased fires, and when you have a fire, you're releasing that, you're not getting any useful energy out of it, you're releasing that CO2 to the atmosphere. That we see and then as we move towards 2016, for instance, you know, into this century, that vast tracts of Canadian forest and Alaskan forest is now a carbon emitter. And it's because of uh, increased uh, fires, severity and uh, frequency or extent of fires. So you don't have to go to the Amazon, we're seeing it happen here. So we have then, in a sense, you know, you think you have a resource, these forests which contain a great deal of carbon. Well, they're becoming a liability. We could see the same thing happening with the carbon which is stored in permafrost soils. As the soils warm, the active layer becomes deeper. We begin to release carbon which has been stored for thousands of years. Similarly with peatlands, similarly with some coastal marsh systems. So this is a really huge problem. How is climate change and the changes we see, for instance, in disturbance regimes like fires, shifting that balance from being sequesters of carbon to emitters of carbon? And it's a big, big problem, and it's one we're trying to tackle in our report. Then there's natural limitations. When a forest stand, let's say after a fire or a disturbance or after logging begins to grow and you have young trees, you know, small trees, rapidly growing. They're putting on wood, they're putting on, you know, forming their trunks and things like that. They're sequestering carbon at a pretty fast rate. As a forest matures, and it doesn't matter if it's here or in the tropics, that rate of carbon sequestration begins to drop off. And so you get a decline of the efficiency in the system. Now, if you have another disturbance, it could release the carbon back in the atmosphere and starts the process again. If you harvest that, material and this is speaking to what Corey said if you harvest the material then you utilize the wood for building and things like that you can tie up the carbon for longer part of that process is for instance collecting the sawdust which can then be made into wood pellets british columbia has an industry of exporting wood pellets to europe for example which comes out of sawdust one resource we leave on the ground is slash the slash is the small material that's left not taken to the mills and typically it's often burned, right? Well, that can actually, a, a large part of that could be used for um, wood pellet production and energy. And of course, when you burn that pellet up into the atmosphere, the carbon goes, but it's captured again by photosynthesis. So it becomes a cycle. And so uh, there is, in, in communities which are in forested areas, there is a potential to store the energy in a sense in the biomass, and use things like wood pellet technology uh, to get at it. But just remember, naturally, there's going to be a limitation to the uh, in many systems, particularly forests, to how efficient they are at that carbon uh, uh, capture. That'll be a natural limitation. And then by changing the climate, we're changing the rules that a lot of these systems are working under, and we're seeing things become emitters. And boreal forest is unfortunately one of those instances. Well, that's really interesting. Uh, just so many variables to take on board there. Um, well, now let me turn to the questions from our audience. And there were a couple there that I really think we should uh, address even 
uh, you know, uh, again, bearing in mind that we can't uh, cover all the bases in a single panel, but perhaps this is also a good, a good uh, uh, flag for, for a future panel uh, for the Royal Society. Uh, here, here I'll, I'll just read a couple of the questions. Oops, I just made them go away. Uh, one audience member says, thanks for the productive and relevant discussion. I'm wondering what is the view of the panel on next generation nuclear technologies? By that, meaning small modular reactors as a complement to renewable energies. Also, a second question, what are the speaker's thoughts on if and how nuclear energy fits into the net zero scenarios? In France, for example, nuclear is a major source of electricity. In other countries, in Ontario, nuclear is a major contributor. You know, and I think we should acknowledge Canada has a pretty good uh, overall, you know, Corey was talking about Nova Scotia, where there's still a lot of coal in use, but the overall, Canada's profile for energy generation is remarkably low on carbon in part because of the combination of nuclear and, and, and hydro. Um, you know, and for people who are wondering, you know, th this comes up again and again, just to, to put some of the advantages on the table, since we don't have a nuclear sector person here, but, you know, we're talking about a low carbon energy source. We're talking about an energy source that has a relatively small footprint on the landscape and also one that provides continuous power in, in a predictable way. So, Panel, what do you think, Corey? You were, you were, uh, you had some things to say, and I, I would just love to, you know, obviously when you're part of conversations that involve the whole energy portfolio and what people are discussing, what are your thoughts when when nuclear uh, is raised? Thank you. Um, yeah, so re really excited to to kind of dive into this conversation, and and by no means are we going to come to any answer, and and, and it's a very divided. Um, subject nuclear. Um, some people believe that it is not good for the environment. It's not pro renewable, and some people believe, or they're in the camp that it, you know it's 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 low carbon, no carbon. Um, it provides great base uh, because it's 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 very um, stable. Um, here in Nova Scotia, we're not going after renewable energy. Um, we are very much looking at bringing on more. Um, renewable energy and looking at using the different resources um, in Atlantic, sorry, we're looking at using the unique resources of each province here in Atlantic Canada, tying them together and then using that as a large grid to support um, each province. Now, New Brunswick has a nuclear plant that's running just along just fine. There's, there's no issues there. Um, so I'm, I'm indifferent with nu nuclear. Um, I think it makes sense for, for different areas. And I think it's a great leapfrog technology while we're getting into um, better battery storage. Um, it's hard to say never in, in this topic. Um, like Ivan, you mentioned, you know, we'll always be um, burning coal at some point. I always get nervous about saying, you know, words like that, because who knows what the, the right, future will right. bring, especially with battery storage. Um, look! Look at how far solar has come from from its inception. Yeah, I by that I just meant that even if there was zero use of coal for electricity generation, there would be still some need for it. In absolutely, yeah. absolutely, yeah. The, the the last thing I want to touch on is is up in the high north. So the small modular reactors. Um, I have some very good friends up in the high north, and they're 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 quite nervous um, of the modular reactors. As I mentioned, electricity is very expensive up in the high north. So there's a huge business case to put these modular reactors because the economics make sense there. It doesn't make sense everywhere, but it certainly makes sense up in the high north. Um, to build a modular react, a small modular reactor up north or to install it, um, the logistics of bringing that system up in the high north is, is grotesque. Um, and then having to have someone that knows how to use it well or uh, the company using its place of privilege to train up someone in the nation to use it is, is would take time. Um, and then the monitoring of it. And then if something happens, and I know it, nothing would happen because the technology has gotten so much better. But if something were to happen in an environment where people are from the land, live off the land, um, and if, if that ecosystem, though already so fragile and already under stress, was to see something happen, um, I don't know what would happen. Uh, you know, the, 
Canadians would have to really rally behind a lot of these high northern communities to provide them support. And currently, we're under water issue, uh, clean water drinking issues. And we as a country haven't rallied behind them already on that. So I, I have my fears for the high north. Got it. I, you know, that's an interesting point. And uh, w well, uh, I'll, I'll round up some thoughts there, but, you know, raising the safety question is definitely putting on the table a big challenge for the nuclear sector, whether, you know, both in terms of real technology, but also perception, public perception, you know, which, which is something that uh, needs to be considered as well. Um, uh, Isabel, you know, uh, as the point was made, there's a lot of nuclear in France as well. Uh, what's, uh, what, you know, wh where do you see this as part of the conversation? Yeah, so uh, it's true that uh, nuclear is uh, an important topic in France. And uh, very recently, the President Macron, um, on November 9th, so a few days, one week ago, in fact, uh, uh, in his speech to the nation, he underlined the advantage of uh, nuclear power in the in the fight against climate change and uh, he announced that france plans to build six more uh, nuclear reactors and also uh, to um, to contract uh, small modular reactors and this is in his views is to guarantee the energy independence of france have uh, our own electric supply at a reasonable cost and also not to be uh, dependent on foreign countries. So in my view, uh, nuclear is also in the, in the mix of, of uh, possible technologies to mitigate climate change. And uh, there are many options and we are lucky that there are many options, uh, renewables, uh, um, um, and also uh, energy efficiency, also uh, nuclear, also nature-based solutions, carbon, carbon sinks, either uh, natural or geologic carbon sinks. So what is really important now is that have discussions and debates at uh, local level, territorial level. What are the best combination of options given my territory? its characteristics, the possibilities, its needs. And then, and this has to be uh, discussed with all stakeholders concerned and, and the civil society. And we, we cannot uh, know now what will be uh, the solutions. And each country and uh, each territory within a country will have its own solution. I think we can find the solutions. And, the, most, the more tools we have, uh, the, the, the easiest it would be to find the solutions to reach objectives at a reasonable cost and that are acceptable, so, socially acceptable. Got it. Uh, just to add to that, because I wanna take advantage of your expertise in this area, another in addition to nuclear, and Glenn, I'm gonna come to you on this too in a minute, but uh, in addition to nuclear, uh, we haven't discussed geothermal energy, and I know in your background, Isabel, this is uh, your own scientific background covers some of this. Is there, a, uh, is there a slice of the pie also for geothermal, and how, how significant could that be? Yes, indeed, geothermal energy is a key renewable energy where you uh, extract heat from the underground to produce heat or electricity. And you can also uh, cool buildings using geothermal uh, uh, heat, heat pumps. So, and uh, geothermal energy um, uh, has, a, has a small footprint on land. So it's also interesting to consider. I think all subsurface solutions are not enough considered. And uh, we have to, you know, we explore the, the space that's great. But we can do a lot underground too, and this is um, rather unexplored. Uh, so in the underground, you can source CO2, uh, as I told about. You can also uh, um, uh, extract geothermal energy. 
and you can also store massive amounts of energy, thermal energy underground, but also hydrogen you can store underground. You can store uh, compressed hair, for instance. So uh, in addition to batteries, which are needed for, you know, for the deployment of renewable energy, it's important to have also a massive energy storage solution and the subsurface can provide this. And uh, so I, I, I would like um, also to, to, to say that uh, um, uh, CCS or to capture and storage is a complement to renewable energy, but it can act also in synergies. For instance, with geothermal energy. In France, we are uh, studying a, a scheme that would bore, bore store CO2 underground and recover the heat from underground in the same project. And uh, there are also synergies between CCS and biomass because when you capture the CO2 emitted by a biomass plant and you store the CO2 underground, in fact, you have withdrawn CO2 from the atmosphere. The CO2 was, which was trapped by the biomass through photosynthesis. And there is a European project in uh, Stockholm, in Sweden, which has just got funding from the EU Innovation Fund for this scheme. Uh, and there is also a combination uh, synergies between CCS and storage of uh, renewable electricity. Uh, for instance, the extra uh, electricity that we cannot uh, easily store could be used to, uh, to electrolyze the water, produce hydrogen, and this hydrogen can be combined with the captured CO2 to produce synthetic carbons, hydrocarbons, that can be easily transported and stored. So this is also a way. So this illustrates there are many, many options, possibilities, and we have to really uh, study what makes sense for, for each territory. That really sounds like the all of the above approach. And, uh, and again, maybe a communications challenge also just to explain to people how all of these pieces will fit together. Uh, really interesting. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the clock now. I see we have about six minutes left. So Glenn, I'm gonna go to you next, but then back to Isabel and finish off with Corey. Uh, and I'm just going to, uh, I want to hear your thoughts on nuclear and other aspects of the energy portfolio, but also uh, maybe wrap it all together. So my final question to you is, what do you see happening in the future? When we look at all of these options, when we look at all of these challenges, uh, you know, and limitations on, on some of the possibilities as we're beginning to learn what the limitations are, what do you see as the plausible path? forward, uh, you know, it, when, when you try to peer through the myths and the crystal ball, what do you think is the most likely thing that we're going to see happening for the next uh, 10, 20 years? Uh, okay. So then, over to you. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll lead into that by just quickly speaking uh, to what Corey talked about and also Isabel in terms of uh, geothermal. Uh, people want to see the debate going on in North America about nuclear. They can look at California. We shut down the San Onofre uh, generating plant because of uh, really an uh, engineering problem. But we still have Diablo Canyon, which is due to be shut down. Just as last week, a study was released by Stanford and MIT, which said it would be a mistake to shut it down. And by keeping it running till 2035, even extending it to 2035, would decrease our uh, you know, it would be equal to about 10% of our transportation generated um, greenhouse gases. Transportation is the biggest generator of greenhouse gases here in California. So that debate is now ongoing here. And it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out. So that's right in the public mind here. Now, this is a large reactor. It's not, a, you know, a modular reactor. It's more like what Ontario Hydro deploys. So that's one thing, and I'm watching that with great interest. I'm not going to come down one side or the other, but I'm watching with interest. About the geothermal, there is an amazing thing being proposed here along the, the border with Mexico near the Salton Sea. Deep underneath the Salton Sea in that area, there is a, a very, very hot, briny, liquid uh, uh, deposit which contains a large amount of lithium. 
which is, of course, a critical component for battery technology as it presently exists. There's a lot of interest now in drilling down to recover that lithium because the United States does not, you know, we depend on other countries for a lot of these, uh, these minerals, rare earths, lithium, things like that, to recover the lithium, but also you can use the geothermal heat from the brine, right? And so I'm following that very closely to see how that goes. Now, the crystal ball, okay, the crystal ball. I think none of these individual solutions we talked about are gonna solve this problem, okay? And if anything, it's important for us to lay out what are the shortcomings, what are the uncertainties, what are really the optimums that we can get. And, and to be honest, that none of them are gonna get us there. Okay, carbon capture alone isn't gonna get us there. Nature-based solutions alone aren't gonna get us there. Deployment of nuclear in one form or the other isn't gonna get us there. We need to put these things together. We need a portfolio that, as Isabel said, is locally, regionally responsive, makes the best use there. In some cases, nature-based solutions are gonna be part of that. But we can also make big mistakes. Many corporations are now involved in the trillion tree uh, um, movement. You know, we're gonna plant trillion trees and that's gonna be a nature-based solution. And a lot of those include petrochemical companies, right? And that will be helpful. But it won't be helpful if we displace African savanna or native grasslands by planting trees, right? So we have to understand what the shortcomings are, and we also have to really be cognizant of the unintended consequences. I see us kind of moving forward with a multi-pronged approach. I think it's going to be driven by economics, where it makes sense we can do things, where it doesn't, we can't. And I think it's... Uh, it's going to be a slow process. And so I am, I'm a little bit worried about meeting goals of 1.5, 1.84, or something like that, because the complexity to, of, to me of this economically, technically, and naturally is huge. But I think by bringing groups like us together and working on this, we're going to get there. I just worry that we might not get there fast enough. That's great. We sure have a lot of uh, incentive as well. You know, just looking at British Columbia flooding right now, that's the, you know, there, there's the world at 1.1 degree. Uh, what, what, what's it going to be like when it's uh, two and a half? Uh, just a few minutes left. So Isabel, over to you with that crystal ball. What do you see as the likely, uh, most likely path forward for the next little while? Yeah. So uh, I think that the uh, uh, as we see in the last uh, two years, that uh, CCS is really starting to, to be deployed. Uh, I told you that there were uh, 27 uh, operational projects in the world, but there are 100 that are in development in many other countries, including in France. So I think that CCS is being uh, acknowledged as a key mitigation uh, climate uh, technology. And, uh, but of course, uh, <laughs> Uh, it's part of a portfolio of mitigation uh, option and technologies. So uh, um, all, all, all the other uh, options also need to be developed and deployed. And in fact, uh, due to the urgency of uh, climate change and the, the fact that we are late in our own objectives of uh, GG uh, emission reduction, I think we need to start doing what we what we are able to do now. All all the technologies and solutions that were mentioned during the panel, they have to to be uh, implemented. Uh, thought and uh, we we should not say I don't want this solution. I don't want this one because we are late and the the urgency of climate change is there. So all what we can do now, we have to do it. Maybe in 10 years time or 20 years time, we will have been able to reduce a lot of our emissions and uh, we will have find other also uh, technologies or ways of living and so on. So we may decide later that this solution, we don't need them, need it anymore. But all what we can do now, we have to start now. Wonderful. What uh, really well uh, uh, stated, Corey. You hear the urgency there. Last word to you uh, from a community 
perspective, uh, how do you see this playing out? Perfect. I'll, I'll be very quick and I'll end this on a high note. Um, I think that um, I, I truly believe that business and working with the government is going to help us pull through. Um, we may not meet our targets, but I think that we'll, we'll get very close and in, in, in time we'll, we'll figure this, uh, this thing out. Um, I always tell people, look at where the pension companies are looking at and look at where the investment dollars are going. And we're seeing lots of investment into renewable energy. We're seeing lots of investment into green technology. Um, and I think that's really exciting and um, something that shows that, you know, there's a business case to this as well as there's hope. So um, yeah, <laughs> that's all I got. Donna, terrific. Let's hope we can keep that hope going and, uh, and also with uh, clear eyes about uh, limitations and the technological barriers that are yet to be overcome. This is a terrific snapshot of where we're at and where we're going. Uh, in a moment, uh, after a short break, we'll be turning it over to the next panel, uh, steered by Hannah Hogue. Uh, and uh, just before we leave you, a uh, big thank you to our panelists today. You've heard from Glenn McDonald, Isabel Chernikowski L'Oreal, and also Corey Matty. I'm Ivan Semenik. Thank you very much, uh, audience, as well, for your questions, and, uh, and get ready for the next panel.